Good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen. The subject of Egyptian mummies has held a fascination for many people ever since awareness of their existence became known outside Egypt many centuries ago. However, the actual process of mummification or embalming remained a mystery until the era of Herodotus. Prior to this, all the contemporary literature from ancient Egypt was concerned with detail of the rituals involved in wrapping the body with linen and all the religious and magical spells and prayers to accompany this process. It was Herodotus who gave us the first detailed description of the techniques used to prepare the body for that all-important process of readying it for burial and its transition to the sacred plane of the afterlife for eternity. The description was passed to Herodotus by the priests and scribes he met on his visit to Egypt and relayed in his book The Histories, Volume 2, Chapter 86, in approximately 450 BC, where he states, The most perfect process is as follows. As much as possible of the brain is extracted through the nostrils with an iron hook, and what the hook cannot reach is rinsed out with drugs. Next the flank is laid open with a flint knife, and the whole contents of the abdomen removed. The cavity is then thoroughly cleansed and washed out, first with palm wine, and again with an infusion of pounded spices. After that, it is filled with pure bruised myrrh, cassia, and every other aromatic substance, with the exception of frankincense, and sewn up again, after which the body is placed in natron, covered entirely over for seventy days, never longer. When this period, which must not be exceeded, is over, the body is washed and wrapped from head to foot in linen, cut into strips and smeared on the underside with gum, which is commonly used by the Egyptians instead of glue. In this condition, the body is given back to the family, who have a wooden case made shaped like the human figure, into which it is put. Whilst this description may be an accurate reflection of the detailed techniques used during the late period, particularly the first Persian occupation, it must be appreciated that mummification techniques changed over time and almost certainly varied from embalming house to embalming house. To put the timeline in context, this slide shows the important points in Egyptian history, with particular reference to the New Kingdom, the Third Intermediate Period and the Late Period. It is often the case that Egyptologists refer to Herodotus' description as a datum point against which to compare different techniques of mummification. Following this principle, I shall look at the mummification of Takabuti with reference to the treatment of the head, the body, and variations used from that datum point of Herodotus. Although the unwrapping in 1835 did a certain amount of damage to the body, there is sufficient remaining evidence to produce a picture of the process in which we can be confident and can then use to make credible assumptions. Commencing with the head, we look first for evidence of excerebration. This consists of the absence of a naturally mummified brain and the presence of foreign material in the cranial cavity. This slide shows that there are three layers of different materials in the posterior cranial fossa. The most posterior is probably residual brain. However, anterior to this is a layer of amorphous matter with a smooth surface, indicating that it is a substance which was inserted in a liquid state and subsequently hardened, so preserving that flat surface. 
Such materials used in mummification include resin, either in pure form or in a mixture with other ingredients, for example beeswax. This particular combination has been confirmed by the chemical analyses performed by Stephen Buckley of York University. The third and most anterior or superficial layer consists of coarse granular material. The latter two layers spill over into the spinal canal in the upper neck region. So, armed with evidence for excerebration, the next task is to identify the route used for brain removal. Starting with Herodotus' description, an inspection of the area of the skull base at the top of the nose, the cribriform plate, shows that this structure is intact. It is therefore necessary to search for other areas which have been described as excerebration routes. The next commonest route, although still rare, is the transforaminal route. In this technique, the upper neck muscles are divided and the skull is bent forwards and twisted to the side to expose the naturally occurring hole in the base of the skull, the foramen magnum. There are subtle indications of disturbance of the normal anatomy of the area, with evidence of foreign material in continuity between the base of the skull and the first cervical, that is the uppermost, neck vertebra. Whilst this is almost certainly the route used for excerebration in Takabuti's case, the unusual observation here is that the normal alignment of the anatomy has been restored, whereas in other cases one finds significant disruption of the anatomy persisting. In the 104 mummy CT scans that I've had the privilege to analyse, only seven demonstrated transforaminal cerebration. And of these seven, Takabuti is the only one in which the anatomy is restored. Although the whole body scan was not available to me, a further example of restored anatomy following transforaminal cerebration has been recorded and verified by myself. This is therefore a very rare technique. Before leaving the area it is interesting to note that the restored anatomy has been secured by the use of a collar of resin placed around the neck. Examination of this collar shows a different radiological signature from that of the intermediate layer of material in the cranial fossa. You will hear shortly that this material around the neck has been shown to be resin. The conclusion to be drawn is that the material in the skull is almost certainly a mixture of resin with another material, of which the most common form is beeswax. Now let's turn our attention to the eyes. These have received the attention of the embalmers. In a previous series of 60 mummy CTs analysed, only 27% had a similar treatment, namely incision, emptying and then packing the eye globe with linen. For the sake of completeness, of the mummies in that series with packed eyes, 50% were from the third intermediate period and a further 29% from the 26th dynasty, with more another 21% from the so-called Roman period, or Greco-Roman period. This gives an indication of how relatively rare eye-packing was outside the third intermediate period and the succeeding 26th dynasty. Turning to the mouth, you've already heard about the state of dentition the only other feature is the fact that a pack was almost certainly placed in the mouth originally, but has now been lost. You can see the resulting gap in this illustration.
If we now turn our attention to the body, it's easy to see that all the viscera have been removed and the resulting cavity completely packed with an amorphous granular material. Again, you will shortly hear about the composition of this trunk packing material. Although all the viscera have been removed, the heart has been returned, wrapped in a package of linen, as shown in the blue ellipse. Whilst this return of the preserved heart may be expected in the light of the weighing of the heart ceremony depicted in the Book of the Dead, the heart of non-royal mummies is only found in 25% of cases and only as a packaged item in 15% of those. That is, as opposed to being left in situ, having never been removed and desiccated separately. In this case, the identity of the organ as the heart is easy to see, as the chambers of the heart are recognisable. The route for evisceration is interesting, as it has been through the perineum, the pelvic floor, not a route seen often in non-royal mummies before the Ptolemaic period, particularly in Aknim, the cult city of the Ithyphallic fertility god Min. In Takabuti's case, packing of the emptied trunk has been with such vigour that the pack used to close the perineal defect has been displaced. This also indicates that there must have been an abdominal incision through which this packing, this filling material could be inserted after placement of the perineal closing pack. However, this cannot be proven because of damage to the anterior body wall in 1835. But there is a hint of the existence of an incision shown in this image. The other point to note in the trunk is the presence of a pack of resin-soaked linen in the upper part of the left chest, shown here in the green ellipse. This is associated with the wound in this region mentioned in an earlier lecture. Whether this was a practical object to plug the defect in the body wall, or was a magical poultice, as suggested by Jonathan Elias of the USA, is open to debate. If anything, the concept of a poultice is more in keeping with the behaviour of the ancient Egyptians in their wish to heal a wound and restore the body to a complete state. Before concluding, I should again mention the state of the left hand. Whilst the condition of the body was almost certainly complete when wrapped in the 25th dynasty, there is a disturbing finding in the left hand. This was mentioned before and indicates that the state of the hand was present at the time of mummification. In view of the otherwise good preservation of her body, it is a mystery why the hand is in such a state. A lack of bony damage would point to an absence of sharp trauma. This leaves the possibility of degradation of the hand tissues due to putrefaction. However, why this should be isolated to the left hand is unexplainable. Perhaps the hand was not as completely covered by natron during the desiccation process as this is the only embalming process to which the peripheral parts of the body are subjected. So, in conclusion, Takabuti's mummification has several unusual features in terms of excerebration, evisceration, return of a removed and packaged heart, and the choice of other features, such as the use of a poultice pack to magically heal a wound. This collection of rare embalming techniques may well indicate that Takabuti's mummification was an expensive process 
indicating a probable high-level status in society. And I'd like to thank you again for your attention.